Last speaker for today is Stephanie Balzer. Stephanie has done a lot of work uh, in uh, different areas uh, of programming languages and concurrency. And uh, what uh, she will uh, present us uh, is a session type uh, concurrent programming. Okay, so. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Marco, for this introduction. Uh, and then also, I, I see a few faces here on my screen, so I appreciate that. appreciate that. So if a few people would leave on their camera, so that I don't speak into the void, that's that's pretty terrible. <laughs> otherwise, okay. And uh, for those of you who just joined now, we said that so Chuta is going to be monitor monitoring the channel for me, the chat for me. Sorry. Well, it's all about channels anyway. So, uh, and because I'm using Keynote and I use the, the split screens and I think there's no way for me really to see the chat, okay? But I can see a few, uh, I can see the, the videos of a few people, so that's nice. Uh, so Chuta will interrupt me if he thinks that it's an important question. Uh, and otherwise, I will also take little breaks uh, for and um, give you the opportunity to ask questions. All right. So yeah. So as uh, Marco has said, this is about session type concurrent programming. So uh, let me briefly tell you what you can expect in this class. So we are, we're going to focus here uh, on concurrent programming and some people might know about uh, the distinction that is being made between concurrency and parallelism. So in this setting, we're really de dealing with concurrency, especially in the later stage of the course where we introduce sharing. And the reason for this is that we have observable non-determinism. So usually people uh, associate or or one key characteristics of concurrent programming is observable non-determinism. Whereas parallelism is more about um, really figuring a cost model for your programming language so that you can get maximal throughput and actually parallelize uh, your, your program and have a cost, mo cost model and uh, influence the scheduler to really get optimal performance. All right, so we're not talking about parallelism, but in the past, at OPLSS 2018, I think there was a special uh, session devoted to parallelism in case you're interested in that. All right, so then roughly the roadmap looks as follows. So first, I'm going to introduce everyone here to message passing concurrent programming. And also, I should also say here that I do know, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that the background of the various people is quite diverse. So I really try to target um, kind of those people who uh, are not familiar with many things that I'm going to talk about. So I will try to do my best to appeal to your intuitions and also provide some side remarks for those people who are already familiar with uh, several concepts that I'm touching on here. All right, but really the novices uh, among you should be able to follow my lectures. And if you feel like that I'm going too fast somewhere, then raise your hand, uh, ping Chuta and, and ask questions. All right, so as a first step, we're really going to explore how it is to work in a message passing concurrent model, how, how kind of, what's the, the experience uh, programming in that setting. And then we are going to explore session types, which are really the types for message passing concurrency. And uh, once we've explored that, we're, we're going to see what, what are the challenges uh, to actually ensure type safety when it comes to session type programming. And we are going to look at linear logic and see in which way is it suited and helps us in addressing those challenges. But as always in life, one benefit can also be disadvantages on another, disadvantages on another end. So later in the course, we are going to introduce uh, what I refer to as manifest sharing. So it's a way to uh, introduce aliases into our program 
but control them such that we still get all the good guarantees that we got previously in a purely linear setting. And then uh, hopefully in the last lecture, I will talk about deadlock freedom. So basically we will explore what constructs we can add to our type system to restore deadlock freedom for our shared session types. Okay, so that's just the rough roadmap, uh, basically to, to prepare you to what is coming, uh, what you're going to expect over the next four days. All right, so I know that there's a lot of terminology uh, in computer science, I guess, in general, and also in programming languages. And when, when you come to OPLSS, you hear a lot of terminology. And a lot of you guys already heard various terms, but probably don't know exactly what they're all about. So in this class, uh, these are kind of, this is a rough map of terms that we're going to explore. And my ambitious, ambition is it for you to understand to have like an intuitive understanding and uh, a meaning for those terms and in particular how they are helpful in a programming context okay just uh you know let, let's uh, kind of pick some of those terms so we're going to talk about the curry Howard correspondence in the session type setting uh, then, as I said, we'll talk about dialog freedom, we'll talk about progress, preservation, uh, we'll also learn why contraction and weakening are um, important structural properties and why it might be helpful not to have them. Uh, we'll talk about intuitionism a little bit, about the sequent calculus, pi calculus, and so forth. All right, so what are the learning objectives that I had for you? So I really want you to know after today's lecture in particular, how we program in a message passing concurrent style. I also want you to know after actually even today's lecture, what session types are really about. Uh, because I imagine that a lot of people have never heard of session types or heard of it, but never, never used it. Um, another important goal of this series of lectures is uh, to bring across to you what are the benefits of building a programming language based on linear logic. And uh, more generally also, um, basically how we can take linear logic and the curry Haver correspondence that we will talk about in or as a guide for us to develop sensible languages. Uh, then we'll also explore how we can accommodate sharing in a logically motivated way. So again, we take inspiration from the curry Howard correspondence and from logic and uh, develop a type system that gives us a way to control aliases in our system. And then lastly, we'll uh, learn how we can reason about deadlock in the presence of aliasing and how we can extend the type system in order to rule out deadlock by type checking. All right, so one thing that I'm really excited about and I would like to point out to you is that uh, there are going to, there's going to be um, two tutorial sessions uh, which are going to be given by Soares Chen so interestingly for you, I guess, is that Soares was actually a participant of the Oregon Programming Language Summer School in 2018. And I taught, and after that, Soares approached me and he wanted a research project to work on uh, because he's, he's an a independent researcher and also a professional software developer. And so out of this came, um, the ferrite session type library for Rust. So Soares um, will introduce you to that library. So if you would like to get some hands-on experience with session types and particularly with that library. And the tutorial is going to be on Friday and Saturday and it's going to be between the second and, uh, no, I'm, I think I'm screwing that up. So any, anything, it's uh, 20 past noon to 1.50. Uh, so it's on the schedule, please look at it. And um, so, so basically he'll tell you about um, specifically 
kind of besides learning how to use the library and explores uh, and, and play with it uh, using some prepared exercises. Uh, he will also tell you what techniques uh, that he used in order to have this embedding of session types work in Rust as a host language. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first part uh, today, which is about message passing concurrent programming. So we're kind of all used to a programming model where we have like a, a program that um, that has maybe access to some shared memory and is going to mutate uh, locations in the shared memory or it's a purely functional program. Uh, but in a message passing concurrent setting, uh, we view computation differently. In particular, computation is really happens by a number of processes that compute by exchanging messages with each other. And in order to exchange those messages, the processes are connected via channels. So here in the figure, I'm showing the, the circles which kind of abstract uh, processes. So this is, these are the processes that, that, that exist at runtime. And then the black lines are the channels that connect those processes. And I've labeled the processes with P1, P2, P3, and so forth. And then also the channels, I labeled them with A, B, C, and D. So one thing I would like you to be aware of is this ternary channel here. So in general, in a message passing concurrent setting, nothing prevents us from connecting several processes to the same channel. So here, the process P3, P4, and P5, they're all connected uh, along channel C. So that means in particular um, that we actually have a form of non-determinism. So what does it mean non-determinism here in this setting? So it means that just imagine that P3 sends a message along channel C. As a result of this, it's actually uh, not determined up front who will receive that message, right? It could be P5 or it could be P4. Okay, so it is really the, the existence of, or the possible existence of anary channels, so channels that connect more than two um, processes that is a source of non-determinism in this uh, model of computation. Um, maybe I would like to make the analogy also with a shared memory and like an imperative programming language or ML with references, for example. In there, we also have non-determinism with threading because when we have threads and threads write to locations concurrently, then it is not predetermined which right will be, um, what, what the order of rights is. So depending on the schedule, how the threads are scheduled and how those rights are scheduled, we can see different results in a, in, a, in a location at the end of the day. So that's somewhat similar uh, to the non-determinism that we have here in this model. It's just two different models. So, um, the particular kinds of non-determinisms that we can see are different, but at a high level of abstraction, uh, they are related. All right, so I would like to point out that uh, this model of message passing concurrent programming has a formal underpinning, and that's in general the process, process calculus. And, um, Stephanie, can I interrupt you for a question? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, I, I got a little bit about um, the difference between a shared memory model of concurrency and mm -hmm. a message passing model of concurrency. Yeah. And essentially, I guess your thoughts on um, what well, we're going for message passing, but whether your thoughts on the two and whether one's, I guess, better, more suited in a different uh, setting versus another. For, for example, oh. like, um, would shared memory be more suited, say, on a single computer setting 
uh, as opposed to like wireless network or something like that. Okay, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, question. Thanks for that. Uh, so I think in general, um, let me first point out to you that actually met the message passing concurrent model is widely used in practice. So one of the first protagonists was Erlang, Erlang programming language. They, they had, um, they really made a point. I, I wanted to devote a slogan to them, but it's actually not that. So, but anyway, they made a point of kind of computing by message exchange, not by, by, by sharing memory. And also Go, for example, has a support for message passing and Rust really highly, um, uh, um, very um, um, importantly uses message passing, right? So I guess you, the question was also, um, well, is it maybe more suited, one more suited for a single process machine whereas in a distributing, distributed setting? And I would say, yes, clearly the message pass in concurrent setting lends itself very nicely for a distributed setting because we can think of those processes as basically different mach machines uh, um, basically being a, a, a kind of spaced apart. Um, and I think another, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to say that one is better than the other. I, because you can basically view a process as a memory cell and then you get shared memory, right? Um, however, the, the process, the message passing setting is more uh, inherently concurrent and shared memory um, also works like in a sequential setting, right? Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that some people like to uh, point out that the message passing setting provides a higher level of abstraction because um, so the the shared memory setting is really very much um, dependent on the particular on the particularities of the machine that we're using. So, for example, the notion of data race is dependent on the granularity of the data and the instructions that we are using to, to, to access the data. Whereas in a message passing model, the granularity is really the, the one of a message. So it is not the case that in message pa passing model, we don't get data races, but they are at a high le higher level of abstraction. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll guess I'll continue now. Uh, I hope that this answer was helpful. Otherwise, I'm happy to talk, talk more in the break about this. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, that the formal model for message passing concurrency is really the process calculus. And an important one, and there, there are various formalizations, but really uh, an important model is the pi calculus, which was introduced by Robin Milner. At the bottom on the slide, by the way, I always use the same uh, symbol. So I have this little book, open book, which points you to, to a paper if you are interested in, in reading about it. So here, this is actually a book. And it's a very, it's a, it's a, small, it's a short book, relatively short book for a kind of a scientific development. It's really a great book. I can, uh, uh, really uh, recommend that to you. It's very concise and you get to know the important bits in just a few pages. All right. Uh, I also would like to point out because you might, uh, that also taps in a little bit into the question that we got about shared memory. So like Lambda calculus, which is basically the formal model for functional programming, and so here we would like to portray the pi calculus as being the formal model for message passing concurrency. So Robin Milner has actually shown uh, basically that the pi calculus is universal by uh, providing an encoding of the lambda calculus into the pi calculus. Okay, so let's look at an example. So how would we in particular uh, kind of code or represent a queue in this model. So we're not going to write code, but we're going to illustrate how we would build a queue out of processes basically. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a queue of processes 
and each process contains a character. So here we have a queue that contains the characters O, P, L, S, all right? And I guess you might, uh, you know, realize what's coming next, but anyway. So again, so the circle denote process is here and they're connected via channels. So really what this queue is, it's similar how you would uh, implement it in an imperative language. Uh, so we basically have a linked list of character processes, all right? So those, the O is connected to the P, the P to the L and the L to the S. And we're going to program the queue such that we dequeue from the front and we enqueue at the back, all right? Uh, and now let's introduce a client process. So here, the client here is to the, to the left. I have it in red or in Bordeaux. And the client is also connected to the head of the queue via a channel. Okay, so now let's play with the queue and let's, uh, let us have the client enqueue a character and we're going to NQS because we want to do have the word OPLSS in the queue. All right. So here the client goes ahead, sends the message NQS to the queue. And now what we're going to do in response is basically we're creating a new process and we attach basically connect that new process to the previously last process in that list. So the second last S is now connected by a channel to S. All right, because previously I said we're NQ at the back and we DQ from the front. All right. So now let's imagine the client goes ahead and sends the DQ message. So now we're going to DQ from the front of the queue which means that the queue in response will send the character O and as a result the process that captured the character O is now going to terminate and is gone and the queue the client is now connected to the new head of the list which is the process that captures the character P. Okay so what we've done so far is basically we, we, we've just had a queue consisting of processes that just ex capture and exchange basic values. In the example, it was characters. But in the original pie characters, um, we were only allowed to exchange channels. Uh, so then in this setting, we could, for example, represent our queue with those pink processes that I introduced, which just represent a character. So we could have an encoding that each, each process can encode a, a character. And then the process element in the queue has a reference to that channel. So I just want to point out, of course, we can use basic values, but it's actually really nice to not only send around basic values, but channel references. This is referred to as mobility in the pi calculus. And the reason why it's called mobility is because when we send a channel along another channel, we can actually change the connectivity structure of our processes, right? So we're, we can, if, if we basically send it away and, and don't keep it, uh, then we'll move edges in our connectivity graph, in our process graph. And in a session type setting, this is referred to as higher order channels. So the analogy is with higher order functions, of course. Functions can be arguments to other functions. So similarly here, channels, can be sent along channels. So at first that might be a bit uh, mind boggling, you know, sending a channel along a channel, right? But if you have experience with imperative programming with references, it's similar, it's really the same thing at the end of the day. So consider a function or method that takes in a reference as an argument. So we can call a function, give it a reference, and here we can send a channel reference 
along a channel to another process. All right. Um, are there any burning questions? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll ask one. Uh, um, the question I got was, are we trying to realize a data structure based on the notion of communicating processes? And that's when you were showing the Q the representation Q. of OPLSS. Right, so I guess right. more intuition for why each, I guess, character is a process, I suppose. Right, right, right. That's a good question. So yes, in, I was really trying to implement a Q data structure using processes. That's right. Um, there are far better examples to use. Um, for example, uh, Soares implemented uh, the Canvas component of the server browser engine using the ferrite session types. All right. But the reason why I chose the queue is because queue and queues and stacks are data structures everyone knows, every computer science student, student is familiar with. So I wanted to use something that you know what the basic working uh, of is. All right. So sometimes in teaching, you just have to use boring examples or, or less, less exciting examples but uh, they have the benefit that everyone is familiar with. And especially now when we look at the protocols that underlie uh, such a queue data structure, it's going to be helpful to, to know how a queue works. All right, then in that case, I move on. So today, next we'll talk about uh, session types. And you can really think of uh, session types as the types for message passing concurrency. So here the idea is when you have like a regular type in quotes or square, square quotes, a type basically abstracts the possible values uh, that, that uh, an instance can have, right? An integer, there can be only um, integer numbers, right? Uh, so, but there are, you know, richer types, behavioral types or refinement types and session types basically fall into that category. So here a session type really prescribes the protocol of message exchange that concurrently interacting processes have to comply with. All right, so session types were introduced uh, by Kohei Honda uh, in his seminal paper, Types for Dyadic Interaction that was uh, published at uh, the Concur Conference in 1993. So as you can see, they've been around for quite a long time. And since then, there have been many, many papers published about session types, and it's still a very active area of research. So let me expose you to the types, how they look like. And as you will see, when you go and explore the literature, the notation varies. So I chose some notation, which you'll find in some of the papers, but you just have to be flexible. Uh, not all the papers use the same notation, but I also use notation that I think is rather intuitive. All right, so basically what I have here, this is an abstract syntax. So A denotes a session type um, and T denotes types, it's the, it's the sort of types which can either be A itself, so a, a, um, a session type, or it can be a basic value. All right, so let's, uh, let me walk you through those session types. So let's look at the first one. This is this uh, question mark and then brackets T, then dot A prime. All right, so this type says, uh, that the next thing that has to happen is an input. So a process of this type will first receive a message of type T, and then it continues with according to protocol or the session A prime. All right. And as I've pointed out earlier, so we have here the possibility to, um, to either send Basic uh, messages of basic values like in string and so forth along a channel, or all of the channels can be higher order, so we can send channel references along it. Okay, 
So the dual to the question mark is the bang, which denotes the sending of a message. So here, if we have a process of this type, it means that the process is going to send a message of type T and then it continues with the session A prime. So let's look at the next two uh, constructs on the next line. Again, they're dual with each, uh, to each other, like, like the question mark in bang. So let's first look at this ampersand braces, blah, blah, blah. All right. So this denotes a so-called external choice. So those two constructs on this line, so the ampersand and here this uh, plus, they um, basically are the sources of branching in our programming language, like an if statement in imperative language, or also like case when you have a language with sums. All right, so what, what does this session type say? It says, all right, a process of this type says, okay, you can send me any of the messages or also label L1 to LN, and depending on the label that you choose, I will continue with the session A1 or to up to AN, all right? So if I receive the label L1, I will continue with session A1. Okay, so then the dual to the external choice, where in the external choice, the client chooses, here we have the internal choice where actually the, the, the process itself chooses. So here the process says, I will send you any of the labels L1 to LM. And after that, I continue with session A1. Okay, then on the next line, we have the possibility to terminate a session. So if this process is of type end, then it will simply terminate, terminate and then ceases to exist. And then lastly, point, let me point out that in a session type setting, we can also support recursive types, of course. And we actually see one uh, in, in our Q uh, data structure. Okay, so let's look how we would encode uh, the protocol that we want for a Q session type using uh, or for a Q data structure using our session types that we have uh, here on the top of the slide. All right, so I will just drop that here, uh, what a feasible uh, protocol is. So what does this protocol say? Well, it says, a queue gives uh, the client the choice between either sending an NQ message or a DQ message, all right? If the client chooses to NQ something in the queue, then the queue will expect the client to send it a character and then it will recurse. So recursing here means, well, after that, the queue is ready again to either receive an NQ or a DQ message, okay? Should the client choose to DQ something from the queue? So the client will send the DQ message and then the queue continues with this session type here, which is an internal choice. So, what will the queue do in response to a DQ message? It will tell the client whether the queue is empty or it is not empty. If the queue is empty, it will send the label none to the client and then it will just simply terminate. Otherwise, if the queue is not empty, it will send the label sum to the client, then it will send the character to be dequeued and then it will recurse. All right. All right. So now let's play briefly with that. So on top, I have the queue session type, which really tells now a client and a provider according to which protocol they have to exchange messages. And then at the bottom, we have our queue that we started out with, which currently contains OPLS, all right. And 
Let's now bring in the type into the picture. So here the client is connected to the head of the queue via the channel Q. And we are going to give that channel the type Q. All right. So basically, this is the type that signifies the protocol according to which we have to exchange messages on this channel, along this channel Q, which, uh, inter which uh, leads into the head of the Q. All right, so imagine we start in a state where the Q is of type, or the channel Q is of type Q. <laughs> And the client goes ahead and sends the NQ message. Well, what happens as a result of this? Well, according to the type, after having received an NQ message, the Q now will have to, is ready to, to basically receive a character. So as a result of this exchange, the type of the channel Q now changes to question mark character Q. Now let's imagine the client goes ahead and sends the character S. We're appending S to the end of the queue. And now as a result of this, well, the channel goes back to being of type Q because the session type tells us that after having received the character, it goes back to Q. Now let's imagine the client decides to DQ as we did before. Because of that DQ, the type now changes to an internal choice where the queue will either tell the client whether it's empty or not empty. Here, clearly the queue is not empty. So the queue will send back the label sum. After that point, the type will change to bang character Q, which means that the queue will have to DQ the the character O from the Q, which it is going to do. And after that exchange, the Q go, the channel Q goes back to being of type Q. All right. So what is unusual and really worthwhile to point out here is that unlike, I guess, any programming language that you're dealt with so far, here values or entities, program entities can change their type at runtime. And the typing accounts for that change. So in particular, the type of a channel and the process that is behind that channel that receives along that channel, that type will change along with the exchange of messages. All right, so it, this might be a little bit unusual. And if you feel a little bit uneasy about this, you have actually very good instincts because there are indeed challenges uh, that arise because the type changes along with the execution of the program. So what we want at the end of the day is that session types ensure protocol adherence by type checking. So if we write a session type program, we want to make sure that when we execute the program, there's no like message not understood or like that a process receives a message that it doesn't expect to receive. So this is referred to as session fidelity or also preservation. So, and it is actually without any precautions, preservation is actually really at risk because of the fact that types of values can change along with the program execution. So in particular, let me illustrate to you why this is challenging. Again, we have our queue and now we, let's imagine we do not only have one client connected to the queue, but also another client connected to the queue. I mean, as we've seen initially, right, in the PyCalculus, there can be any channels. 
So client one and client two can, con can use the same channel Q, be connected along Q to the, to the Q. All right. So why is that problematic? Let's again start out uh, in a state where the channel Q is of type Q. And now let's imagine client one goes ahead and sends the NQ message. After that, the Q will expect to receive a, a character and then it continues as Q. But nothing prevents client two to go ahead and client Q, Q still thinks that client two still thinks that the Q is at program state Q. So it sends the DQ message, but obviously that doesn't match with the state of the Q because the Q now expects to receive a character. All right. So this is the basic challenge uh, that we have to deal with in a session type setting. Um, Stephanie, and... can we go back two slides? There's a question yeah, um, sure. about two slides ago. Uh, like this question... or before that? Uh, one more. Mm -hmm. I, I guess really like before that. Like uh -huh. here? Yeah, right here, I think. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can we have the queue type not type check upon DQing an empty queue? Um, I can read it again. Um, right. I'm not sure if I exactly understand the question. Good. It says, can because we have the Q understand. type uh, not type check upon DQing an empty Q? Um, I, I'm not quite sure. So okay. I'm uh, addressing yeah. my question, the question to the best of my abilities. And otherwise, I'll, I'm happy to talk after the lecture with this, uh, with the participant. But I think the participant is pointing out to the fact that, uh, so basically in an imperative language with references, we sometimes use null, null references, right? Null pointers. And uh, typically when a queue is empty and you try to dequeue, then you, you have an exception. So maybe the participant is pointing out to the fact that we use here internal choice in order to basically uh, have a case distinction whether the queue is empty or not. And uh, provided that we use that and our program type checks, uh, then uh, if the queue, and, and we, we've implemented our program correctly, then if the queue is empty, uh, then it will send the message none. So it won't be able, it, the, the client won't be able to dequeue anything. So basically using the internal choice prevents here the client from dequeuing when, when the, the queue is empty. Okay. All right, so let me uh, go forward. Um, so we had here the issue with the NQ and the DQ. And so that a challenge is really to do with uh, protocol verification. And uh, so one thing I wanted to point out for those of you who are familiar, familiar with preservation, like, like when we have, when we prove like you, I'm sure that Bob talked about this in his lecture, but we have like tapes, type safety in order to prove type safety, the canonical uh, theorems that we have to prove are progress and preservation, right? And preservation usually in a functional imperative setting says, or oh, let's go with a functional one. If E is uh, of type tau and E transitions to E prime, then E prime is of type tau. Well, in this setting here, well, if E transitions, actually it will change its type. So preservation here, what, but what remains invariant is that the client and the provider really are always in agreement what the type should be. Okay, that's the thing I want to point out. So we we phrase preservation in this setting as that the expectations of a client and a provider always match. So if a step is taken, then the client and the provider are still in agreement on the type. Okay, so given that we have this fundamental challenge, so without any precautions, we are doomed to fail. Uh, preservation is at risk. So there is the one strategy that we can employ, uh, and that's the, the, to use linear types or also so-called ownership, which is also familiar from, from Rust, uh, or there have been ownership type systems um, developed uh, also for certain programming languages 
So we can use linearity or ownership to restrict, basically to make sure that the scenario that I'm showing here on the slide cannot never be true. So ownership ensures that at every point in time, there can only be one client, all right? So that's the first strategy that we can uh, employ. And because we disallow multiple clients, then whenever a client uh, engages in an action with a provider, it, the type changes and they will always be in agreement with each other because there's no one, no other client that, that can basically interfere. Another possibility that we'll discuss later is actually to allow multiple clients to exist but to make sure there's some sanity. So we're basically restrict or control, control the aliasing. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about probably in the third lecture, hopefully, um, which is what I refer to as manifest sharing or just the ability to have a controlled aliasing with, with sessions. All right. So, but first we are going to explore the first strategy and we're going to use linear logic for this purpose. So because I know that not everyone is familiar with linear logic, I'm going to explore first the concepts that linear logic will provide um, to us from a programming point of view so that everyone gets the, the right intuitions. And then we'll wrap up and basically explore brief, briefly logic, uh, the, the logical underpinning and also the curry Harvard correspondence. Just briefly, uh, these are certain notions that you've probably already heard about. So linear logic is a so-called substructure logic. And why it's called substructural, we'll, we'll learn later. Um, and, but what I want you to um, take away at this point it's really a logic, it's also referred to as a logic of resources, or I think for now the intuition that you should uh, take away is that it's, it allows us to track ownership. So, as I said, we'll first explore this idea of tracking ownership from a programmatic point of view, and then we'll explore it formally later on. So that for those of you who are familiar with logical linear logic, they probably already can see, uh, see linear logic in the rules that we're exploring in the typing rules, but then I, I will basically bring hopefully everyone on the same, so, same stage. Okay, so these are the types that we are going to use. So I'm just going to use right away the linear connectives that are over here. Uh, some people might have seen them already. Uh, here in the second column, I, I provide the terminology. So this is also referred to as tensor and it's the so-called multiplicative conjunction. But if you have never heard about this, then I'll just suggest you go with the third column here. So we have basically, as before, the types, the session types, uh, according to Honda, we now have here now corresponding types or connectives and we just use the linear logic connectives in order to more or less express the same thing. So here the A tends to be denotes channel output, so the ability to send a channel over a channel. The lolly A, lolly B denotes channel input, so receiving a channel uh, over a channel. Then again we have the two choice constructs, so the two branching constructs, so external choice and internal choice. They interestingly basically uh, uh, use the same signs. And then we have here one, so the unit for tensor, which denotes termination. Okay, just to briefly point out, for simplicity, I restricted here the branching to two, uh, to, to, to binary constructs, but there's nothing that prevents us from generalizing it. And for programming, we use the anary branching constructs. But, um, I use those because then we have a more immediate uh, correspondence to logic. Okay, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is also I restricted to only higher order channels, but we can easily extend the, this type system with value types. But just for simplicity, let's, let's go with that. 
And I've also removed recursive types for now because the curry hover correspondence really only uh, upholds uh, in, in that setting. All right, so now let's go with those new connectives uh, and let's just rewrite the Q session type now using uh, those connectives from linear logic. So again, uh, we have here a Q session type that is defined uh, over here. Let me briefly point out to you that this is a polymorphic session type. So here the Q is polymorphic in the type of its element. So the element here would be of type A. All right. So, oops, sorry, let me go back. So here again, uh, we have the Q is an external choice offering the choice between either sending an NQ message or a DQ message. If the client chooses the NQ message, it has to first send the element to be NQ, which is of type A, and then the Q continues uh, recursively. Otherwise, if the client sends the DQ message, the Q will tell the client whether it's empty or not empty. In the former case, the Q will terminate. Otherwise, the Q is going to send a channel reference of type A and then it continues recursively. All right, so far so good. Now we are going to introduce the typing rules, all right? And so I'm going to kind of, I guess, revisit certain things that Bob talked to you, but slightly differently. All right, so how are we going to type um, programs that we write using those session types? So there is a fundamental concept uh, in type systems, which is the notion of a typing judgment, all right? And I'm going to walk you through the typing judgment that we use to type our process programs consisting of processes. All right. So the judgment looks like this. We have things on the left, then we have a turnstile and then things on the right. All right. And from logic, and you've seen those kind of things already in Bob's lecture. So basically this is the notion of, of a hypothetical judgment. I'm pretty sure that Bob mentioned that in the first lecture. Uh, so we are basically reasoning from hypotheses. Everything here on the left is a hypothesis. And you can think of it in terms of logic as we are proving something assertion A using hypotheses A1 to AN. But here this is now a, a typing judgment to type a process. Okay, so let me show you how we read this judgment. Well, here this P denotes a process term. So that's the P, the process program that we're running. And we say that, okay, this process P offers a session of type A along its channel X. And it is using sessions offered along those channels in here. So this P uses channels X1 to Xn and X and, and they offer sessions A, A1 to AN. All right. So I would like to point out that I'm using here an intuitionistic linear sequence. All right. So um, later on, I'll say a little bit more about intuitionism in this setting. If you don't know what it is, it's okay. Just, you know, accept this terminology. Um, in general, when we use such a sequent, it, we refer also tend to refer to the things on the left as the antecedent and the thing on the right as the succedent. Okay, so now that we have this sequent, we can build inference rules using that sequence and I'll walk you through kind of the schema of those inference rules because we use them later on to type uh, our uh, our programs. So I will show you the typing rules using this judgment and the rule schema that I'm developing next. All right, 
So an inference rule here is looks basically as follows. I am using here uh, the sequent, a sequent calculus based formulation. And I will explain you how to read those rules. And for those of you who are familiar with typing rules like of functional programming languages, I'll point out to you that those are based on natural deduction. So the way how we read the rules are is slightly different. So that's why I'm going to explain or walk you through the through how we basically you read the rules here. Okay, like you're already used to, below the horizontal line, we have the conclusion. And above the horizontal line, we have the premise. So when we do proofs, we know that if we have the premises, we can apply the rule and get the conclusion. All right. When we want to reason in term programmatically uh, about this rule, or also when we try to find a proof, so in proof search, or when we try to type check, using the sequence calculus formulation, we can always do a bottom up reading of the rule, always. In natural deduction, that depends of the, um, on the kind of rule, all right? So that's the big advantage of a sequence calculus based formulation. But the reason really why it is very helpful to use the sequence calculus based formulation in our setting is because it's very apt to express state changes. And as you now know, session types are all about how things change. A, uh, along with message exchange. So in particular, we have here the process terms. So what is between the turn style on, and those double dots is the process term. So that's the program that we're running. And as you can see, that has sequencing like a semicolon built in. So we say currently we're running P and after that we are going to run Q. So you can see now again in terms of type checking and also like the, the, the program, we read the rule again from the bottom to the top. So what is the premise of the rule is the continuation queue of the program. Okay, so that's just the general schema of how we read this rule and can think about the programs that we're type checking. Then I want to point out that we have two forms of rules for every connective. So again, if you are familiar with natural deduction, then we have introduction and elimination rules, all right? The introduction introduces a connective, which means that the connective is in the conclusion of the rule, and the elimination eliminates the connective, which means the connective is at, in the premise of the rule. So that's only for, for those who, who know about this. Well, here in the sequence calculus, we have analogous thing like an intro and an elimination rule, but they are so-called right rules and left rules. So the right rule can be thought of as a introduction rule and the left rule as an elimination rule. But as you can notice is, and I, I have here the subscript right, uh, and left. But in contrast to natural deduction, we always have the connective that we're looking at in the conclusion, but once on the right of the turnstile, hence the right rule, and once on the left of the turnstile, hence the left rule. And here I just use this symbol to stand for an arbitrary connective. All right. All right. So what does that mean? If we have the left rule, we can describe the interaction with a process that offers such a type from the point of view of a client. And with the right rule, we describe the interaction from the point of view of the providing process. When you think about this, when we have a channel that connects two processes, a client and a provider, here we have two rules to type both endpoints of the connection. 
once the right tool for for typing the endpoint from the point of view of the provider and once the left rule to type uh, the, the interaction from the point of view of the client. All right, as much for like the high level overview here. Stephanie, just to clarify, uh, sure. the diamond just stands for any connective. Right? Exactly, so it stands it. for I pick and choose, use a tensor, lolly, uh, ampersand or plus. Okay. All right, so that's abstract, but I think it's a useful mind map for you to understand how to read the rules and what's going on. Um, so there are also uh, questions on the whole idea of bottom up reading. Yeah. Um, for example, one of them is um, why is the continuation considered as a premise of a rule? Right, that, that really has to do with the sequence calculus. Uh, based notation. So just bear with me and accept it that that's a good way of reading the rules. I'm providing you the intuitions because um, those rules are uh, based on logic. But what we're doing is we're using logic, which is inherently there's no computational model associated with logic, but we are inhaling it a computational model and then use that uh, to, 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 to build our programming language. And from a programming language point of view or a computational point of view, we can think of the premise as the, the continuation. All right. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at the inference rules, the typing rules that allow us to type a channel output. So the sending of a channel which is also the multiplicative conjunction in linear logic. All right. Um, are there any other questions? I think we're good. We're good? OK. So I'm going to show you kind of uh, parts of that infer inference rule. And we're going to develop the, the missing pieces together. So what I would like you to keep in mind is, so we're going to basically define the rules together. And what we'll keep in mind is that we want to make sure that at any point in time, there's only one owner, only one client who is basically the owner of a channel along which a process offers, all right? So we're going to build the rules such that this is always, always holds true. Okay, so here we have um, basically the channel output. So it means we have here a process, this program here. And as you can see, the first thing this process is going to do, it's going to send along its offering channel X at channel Y, all right? So, you read this send along x, y, and then it continues as p. So as pointed out before, we have now in the premise, we have to type check the continuation, which will offer also a along a channel x, right? And here the session type says, it's going to send us a channel of type a, and then it continues as p. Now let's figure out what, what's the type that show, has to show up here. If we were at, in Oregon, I would ask you now, but why assume it just doesn't work? I'm, I'm used to an interactive style, but um, with everyone muted, Barchuta, that doesn't work. So, <laughs> and we don't want to have all the background noise. All right, so I'll, I'll give you some time to think about it. Well, after we've sent the channel A, we have to continue with the session B, B. So it means that our continuation P will offer a session of type B. All right. So, well, we are sending a channel Y, right? So we better have a channel Y in, uh, that we are using. So obviously it means that we have some channels that I just abbreviate with Delta. So Delta in channel just refers of, uh, uh, basically abstracts over a set of channels that I, I don't want to provide any further details, but I single out one specific channel here, which is the channel Y, 
which obviously has to be of type A because we are going to send a channel of type A along our offering channel. All right, so now let's figure what channels will our continuation P have access to once it sends the channel A away. All right, so that's now really important, right? Consider that we want to establish or make sure that at any point in time, there's only one owner of a channel, only one client. Well, currently, this process P is a client of this channel Y, and it sends it away. So if we want to make sure that whoever receives the channel is now the only owner, the only client of the channel will better uh, no longer keep it, right? So here, it's important that in the continuation, continuation P, we lose access to that channel because we gave it away. All right, so now we looked at the right rule, which describes the interaction of A tensor B of a channel output from the point of a provider. Now let's uh, uh, develop the type rule that helps us to type check a client of such a process. So here we have, we are using, so we are a process that runs this program here. Itself, it's offering along some channel C, some session type C. We don't care exactly what that session type is, but we know that among some other channels in Delta, it has access to a channel that is of type A tensor B. All right. So, and what does it do? It receives along the channel X, so along this channel X here, and binds the result to Y. And we see this here also with the little subscript in the continuation Q, we have a new binding Y. All right. So, well, what do you think? The continuation Q, what will be its linear context here? So it still has access to delta, but what about channel X? Well, obviously the type of that channel now has changed, right? It will be just B. But we're receiving something because as a matter of fact, the provider has sent the channel Y away. So we now are the unique client of that channel. Okay, so far so good. So let's look at kind of the duals of those, or yes, yeah, so in a, in a metaphorical sense, duals uh, of the multiplicative conjunction, which is the multiplicative uh, implication, uh, which is the lolly, which stands for channel input. So here now the provider receives the channel, okay? So we are using here the connective A lolly B, telling that we're receiving a channel reference of type A, and then we continue with B. As a result here, we're executing this process term. So we receive along our offering channel X and find the result to Y. And then we continue with P. And again, in the continuation, we have a binding for Y. Okay, so um, now the question, first thing is, what's going to be the, the type that is offered by our, our continuation P? Well, obviously this has to be P, right? Because we continue with session type B. So X is in the, in the continuation offering a session of type B then what is going to be in our linear context? Again, we're receiving something. So we now have a channel Y of type A in our context. Well, now the left rule is somewhat dual to this. So here we are sending along a channel X that we have in our context that is of type A lolly B we're sending a channel Y, and then we continue with Q. Again, it's the left rule, so the right-hand right side is not uh, further um, specified, 
We're offering along some channels Z, a session C, and our continuation will offer the same session because we are communicating to the left. All right. So because we are sending a channel Y, we better have a, um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, we must have that Y, but I'm ahead of my animations. So let's first distinguish or determine what the, the type of the continuation is here for X. It will be Y. And then, as I said earlier, we better also have a channel Y handy here that we send. And again, I would like you to uh, notice that or observe here that in the continuation, in the conclusion here, currently we have access to this channel Y, but, be, but because we make sure that we have an ownership model um, employed, we lose here access to Y. Okay. So now let's look at one of the branching constructs. So far we have looked at channel output and input. Now let's look at the branching constructs. So uh, let's first look at the internal choice. Well, the internal choice provides two alternatives, right? Either we are continuing with a session A or with a session B. And we basically tell the client whether we will be running the left one, so a session A, or the right one and a session B. So that means for the continuation in, in the first right rule, we'll continue with session A, and in the second one, we continue with session B. So here I would like you to observe that because we have two branches, possible branches to take, we have two right rules, okay? And if we had any, any branches, we would have n right rules for it. So since we're just communicating a message and not actually uh, sending a channel, the, in both cases, we are not changing any, any uh, changing the delta. So now let's look um, how we type check a client of such a internal choice. So here we are a client that offers along some channel C, a session C, and we have in our context a channel X that offers an internal choice of A or B. So because we don't know which branch actually will be communicated to us, we have to be prepared to either continue with the, with the program Q1 or the program Q, Q2. Well, if the provider sends us the in left message, we know that the channel X will of type A and we continue with the branch Q1. Otherwise, we know that X will be of type B and we continue with the, the branch Q2. All right, so again, just to drive that home, that message home, here the internal choice provides uh, the choice to, or gives the provider the, the choice, whereas the external choice gives the choice to the client. And here I've just shown basically the binary choices, but we can easily generalize that to binary choice. And then usually what we write is, we combine those in one kind of generic rule where we have subscript to denote the different branches. So here we would have basically an AI and, and then we would have for each AI, we would have also here a PI and then have a, a premise. Okay, so we're heading towards the end of the lecture. Uh, but let me show you the external choice before we conclude for today. Then we've basically seen the, the main connectives of linear logic and how we can use them for session types. All right, so the external choice gives the choice of choosing a branch to the client. So here we have a provider 
that offers or gives provides uh, or gives the, the client the option to either choose session A or B. So here now, as opposed to the internal choice where the client cases, here it's the provider that has to do the case statement. So it will case on the offering channel X and either execute program P1 or P2. So we have two premises here. And then again, if um, the if the client uh, sends uh, the label in left, then we'll continue with program P1 and now offer a session A. Otherwise, we offer a session B. And then again, we'll basically not uh, change our linear context. And Previously, for the internal choice, we had two rules, two right rules, uh, because the external choice is somewhat dual of the internal one. We have now two left rules. And here uh, it is actually uh, the client uh, that chooses a label. So the client either sends the label in left or in right. And if it sends in left, then in the continuation, the channel X is A. Otherwise, the channel X is B. And just to summarize, again, external choice can be generalized to NRA choices. OK, so I think that the lecture starts at uh, ends uh, after one, 20 minute, one hour, 20 minutes, right? OK, so uh, to briefly wrap up, um, I, I have prepared more slides for today, so we'll just do them tomorrow. That's no problem. Um, so what we'll do tomorrow is we'll finish up um, the connectives of linear logic and how we can interpret them as session types. And then, as I said, we'll basically now look at it from the other point of view and we'll make the connection, really finalize the connection to linear logic in particular will understand why linear logic is called a substructural logic and what weakening and contraction have to do with it. All right, so I'll stop screen sharing. Oh, Stephanie. Oh, uh, no, that, uh, yeah, actually, wait a minute. Yeah, do you have time I for the questions? wrong thing. Yeah, I, sure. I, I queued up a couple. Yeah, OK, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is uh, uh, someone pointed out there's a typo on the last slide. Uh, in the oh. left rows, you have A plus B, not A and B. Oh, okay, thank you. That was in the, all right, so let me, in the, okay, I will correct that. Thanks a lot. And uh, I don't know how much time we have, but there were a couple interesting bar discussion questions mm -hmm. that um, are sort of high level. One of them is, uh, Modern research seems to have mostly stopped using the actor model and associated terms to describe systems like this. Is it overly specific or is there some other cause? Did that okay. capture the entire question? Oh, uh, there was an initial part. The question began with what happened to the actor model? And then it followed up with um, modern research seems to have mostly stopped using the actor model. Okay. So, well, there's actually plenty of research still uh, on the actor model. And it's true that the actor model is also a message passing model. And so that's, that's uh, there's a relationship to session type because it's message passing. However, I have to admit that I'm, I've never worked with the actor model. So there are various differences. So for example, the session types that I'm working with here really type checking guarantees uh, compliance with protocols. Um, the actor model is really more about message passing, but the typing in, uh, I don't want so please don't quote me on that, but I think typing doesn't guarantee protocol adherence. And, um, uh, but for example, there have been, um, um, for example, there's Opka, I think it's called, there's for Scala, there's an actor model integrated. So I, I'm not the, the right person to ask whether, in, to my knowledge, it's still being used. And there's also active research on it. Um, I can only say that the work that I'm presenting here has a more logical underpinning and a more type-driven 
underpinning than uh, the work on actors. So, so by the way, it's also totally fine for me if, if people, I think uh, Jim mentioned the possibility that people could now unmute themselves and ask questions directly. I'd be happy uh, if people want to do that. Yeah, feel free to. I do have a couple of questions queued up, but if those people um, who, yeah. Well, uh, I have, uh not really a question rather a note uh, during the lecture i was i was uh, wondering about whether it's possible if the uh, oh other way around i feel like uh, the choice is not primitive if we would allow the types to be dependent uh, dependent types of receive and send types uh, in that uh, we basically, if we had uh, a channel that admits uh, sending booleans, then we would have something akin to uh, binary choice. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, there are session type developments that actually use dependent types, so you have de dependent sums and products. So you can do this uh, absolutely. Um, Given that we are basing on linear logic, there is this nice con uh, correspondence with um, with uh, with n plus. But there are so, for example, there is a the um, actress. It's a session a session development in uh, Iris. Uh, so they use dependent products and sums. Thank you. Sure. Welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, I can uh, add another one from a while ago. Uh -huh. um, actually, Stephanie, can you see chat? Yeah, I can. Uh, it, okay, now it's quite can... long, so I'll yeah. copy paste it. Do you, okay. If you want me to read it, I can read it. But uh, sure. I, okay, I'll, so I'll read it. So, rumor has it that the pi calculus came after processes already existed and failed to influence system design. Unlike the lambda calculus, pi calculus has no successful implementations. Much theoretical work has been done on it, but it led to a few innovations in practice. Is this gossip true? Oh, okay. Well, I have to be careful here, right? I'm not going to make <laughs> statements on Zoom. It is true. Uh, there is a lot of theoretical development on the pie calculus. So actually, give me one second. All right, so there's uh, so there's this uh, nice book. Oh, let me get that too. All right, so this is Milner's book. All right, which which is the one I have on the slides, which is very accessible, very concise, uh, kind of the starting point. This is a book by a famous book by David A. San Giorgi and David Walker. All right. So lots of development, uh, basically additions, extensions. And the literature and the, the research development surrounding the Pi calculus is really massive. There have been various, uh, you know, that, for example, here, so the original type Pi calculus is untyped. Then in this book, uh, they explored, they explore um, typed pi, cal pi, pi calculi and, and various versions. And then there's also, there's a, the whole, an important uh, theory basically originated in this setting and already described in here is the notion of a bisimulation. How can we reason about equivalence between, between processes, all right? So that's very, very important theory. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but the notion of pi simulation has been very influential and as such, uh, very important. Um, I, I'd say, I wouldn't say that uh, process calculus I have fa failed in practice because as I said earlier, there are various real world languages that are using that model. Like, um, 
like to some extent as uh, Akka in Scala with the actual library. But then, as I said, so there's message passing concurrency in Erlang, there's in Go, there's in Rust. Uh, and, and for example, I know that the servo team at the time in uh, Mozilla Research, they really heavily employed message passing and use channels. So that's what I can say uh, so far. All right, so- uh, uh, Can you show that book, uh, the, the bigger book? The, the bigger book. Yeah, the, the author's names are not clear, so. Okay, so the one is, uh, one author is Davide San Giorgi, and the other one is David Walker, but here there's some word of caution. There are various David Walkers in, in programming language research. <laughs> So it's not the David Walker from Princeton. So, uh, all right. Yeah, so someone now uh, posted it in the chat, the title of the book. So Prasant had a question and I think he said he'll read it. Yeah. All right, hi. Um, hi. So one of the question that I asked was, I, I'm not sure if you responded to it already. Um, so I think my main thing was in the current model, the type of the channel keeps changing, right? right? But um, we already know a priori what are the external and internal choices that are available. But what if for a process, the external and internal choice depends on the data that was sent over the channel? Meaning that if two processes are communicating, one process sends a message mm -hmm. based on the value that it sees in the message, it decides what the next message should be coming out from it. Yeah, that's exactly what external choices are for, right? So here the, or, or choices in general. So the, you can, if, if I'm a client of a process that offers an external choice, I, I can make the choice of what message, what, what label to send to the provider. And the provider has to um, be ready to deal with either. Uh, tomorrow we'll implement together, we write the code just on paper for the queue, then maybe that becomes a little bit um, clearer. But okay. uh, you can really think also like if you're familiar with an if statement, right? When I write an if statement, I basically have to supply the code for the case that the condition is true or the, the condition is false, right? Mm -hmm. So. In, in this sense, that's uh, similar with an external or internal choice. When you write the code or like a sum in a functional language, all right? Okay. When we case on a sum, we write the code for each, each possibility. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I means what I was wondering is, can the choices change? Can it, uh, can I have dynamic? No. Choices. Oh, okay, good, good question. No, so you you have to provide. So what what is dynamic is the the particular branch to execute is chosen dynamic dynamically depending on on which label you receive. Okay. However, the the code you write statically code to be executed for each branch. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So I think there were two more questions, but we are over time. I, I, I guess I should just confirm if you're fine if we go over time time-wise. I'm totally fine, yeah. Okay, so the next question is, uh, is anyone carrying on Robin's late research on biographs? Uh, Robin? I, I assume Milner, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with biographs. So who, who maybe someone can uh, say more about that? Yeah, so the clarification is Robin Milner. But... Oh, okay, yeah. No, um, I'm not familiar, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Um, and the other question um, is, do you, do you want to unmute yourself? I can also say it. I'll just say it in three seconds, three, two, one, okay. Uh, what about ambient calculus? Does it relate closely to Pi calculus? Oh, I don't know. I have, to, um, I'm not familiar enough with the ambient calculus. Okay, so I think that's, uh, those are all the questions. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, for all the questions and 
pleasure. Okay, on all right. Okay. <laughs> okay, then I guess everyone's tired now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't hear. I got audio problems. Can you hear me oh. now? Yeah, I can hear you, Michael. Yeah, sorry. I just said thanks for the uh, speed you presented at for someone that is, you know, roughly familiar with the channel passing part, but not with the typing. This is a good speed for me. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, please uh, provide that kind of feedback. Uh, so I, I try to go. I, I, it seems like I went at the right speed. Yeah, yeah. For for a lot of the other, uh, a lot of the other lectures, I've been kind of, you know, tripping. But this one's been really good. I can keep okay, it. excellent. I'm very happy about that. Thanks All right, that. and I think there were some questions also in the chat about. I will be. I, I'm happy to write the lecture. Uh, I I just have because I had a little bit more material. I didn't want to post them uh, before the lecture because I didn't want to already reveal what I might not cover. So I, I'm going to remove those last slides that I didn't present today and I will uh, make them available. I'll, I'll consult with Jim how to do that. <laughs>